Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the third annual Villanova University Business Leaders Forum, sponsored by the Villanova School of Business. My name is Narav Shah, a senior finance and management major from Morristown, New Jersey. It is my privilege to be here to welcome you all tonight and to kick off what I am sure is to be a very enlightening forum. You know, I was taking a look at the agenda for tonight, and I saw in the program for the evening that they're going to be broadcasting the first presidential debate. Uh, I'm sure many of you guys are very excited to see it, as am I, because this will be the first ele presidential election that I'll be able to vote in this November. But as always with politics, some tensions might flare up, so I'm going to go ahead and remind you all now that we're going to have to keep tonight as amical as possible. And if at any point you get caught up in a heated debate, just remember that there's one candidate that we can all support, Jay Wright for president. <laughs> but speaking of politics, talking about the upcoming election and the various issues with friends, it's led me to reflect back on my four years here at Villanova and to see how much I've grown. Yes, I'm still, still the same tall and lanky kid to my mother's dismay, that arrived here freshman year, but I've also matured in a lot of ways. I've gained the experience of working at two Wall Street firms and am proud to say that I have a full-time position after graduation working in sales and trading in New York City. Thank you. I had the opportunity to study abroad at the London School of Economics where I could brag to my friends back here on campus that I was legally enjoying a pint of beer at the ripe old age of 19. Some decisions were not always for the best, like the time I thought it would be cool to grow out a beard during sophomore year. And yes, those pictures are still on Facebook. There were other times that were great, like the fun time I spent camping out outside the pavilion when ESPN College Game Day came here for a visit. There were also some not some fun times, like those two all-nighters I pulled out in the Bartley Exchange for my competitive effectiveness paper that was due. We've had this slogan, Ignite Change, Go Nova, for a little over a year now. And I do have to say, it took a little while to catch on with the student body, but now I can really see why it was appropriate. I look around and see the tremendous change and impact that my fellow students are having today, whether it be as simple as raising an out-of-the-box opinion uh, in the classroom, or traveling halfway across the world to help at a refugee camp. Thanks to a Villanova education and the opportunities it's provided, my peers and I have the tools to ignite change one step, one voice, and now for the first time, one ballot at a time. It is now my honor to introduce a man who has been recently appointed to ignite some change of his own, Patrick G. Majidi the Helen and William O'Toole Dean of the Villanova School of Business. Now, Dean Majidi has asked me to keep his profile brief, but I thought I'd share just a few of his many accomplishments, both in the private sector and academia. Prior to becoming Dean, Dr. Majidi was director of the ICE Center here at Villanova and an associate professor of strategic management and entrepreneurship, where he was widely recognized and was published in a number of top management journals. Prior to academia, Dr. Majidi spent nearly 15 years in the steel and mining industry, where he founded two successful companies and served in a number of roles, including CEO. Dr. Majidi received a BS in chemistry from St. Joe's University, boo, <laughs> an MBA from Johns Hopkins University, and a PhD in strategic management from the University of Maryland College Park. Please welcome me in uh, welcoming Dean Majidi. Well, that's a tough act to follow, I would say. Next year, we're going to have a student that's less articulate and, and <laughs> make me look a little better. Thank you, Nirav. Well, good evening and welcome to uh, Villanova University's 2012 Business Leaders Forum. This is VSB's premier event that we hold annually to gather and to thank those of you that are serve on our advisory councils and other Villanova stakeholders for a day and a half of networking and dialogue on important industry topics. 
Uh, before we begin, I'd like to recognize some of the folks in our audience, beginning with Reverend Peter Donahue, our university president. Members of our university board of trustees, Catherine Keating, who is the vice chair. Denise Devine, if you could all put your hand in the air so everyone can see you, I'd appreciate it. Dr. Helen Horseman. And in particular, I'd like to uh, say hello and thank Sheila Clem for being here this evening. Uh, we will honor her later this evening with the Bartley Alumni Medallion. She's joined by her husband, Henry, her son, Hank, her parents, Judy and Gordon Friend, and a number of guests. Where are you, Sheila? Thank you. <clears throat> we also have members of Father Peter's cabinet that I'd like to recognize. Uh, Reverend Kale Ellis, my boss, the Vice President of Academic Affairs. Uh, Mike O'Neill, Vice President of University Advancement. Steve Fugali, Vice President and Chief Information Officer. Where are you, Steve? And Ann Diebold, Vice President of University Communications. Thank you all for, for taking time out for us. Uh, I'd also like to thank our title sponsor, GE Capital Corporate Finance, and its President and CEO, alumnus Tom Quinlan, for providing us with such generous title support, as well as uh, 25 other sponsors uh, for their generosity in supporting the Business Leaders Forum. You can find a full list in the, in the program booklet that will be handed out tomorrow. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to thank our, our Centers of Excellence staff and directors. In particular, Dr. Matt Libertor and Tom Coglin from the Center of Business Analytics. There, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Doe and Kim Cahill, uh, Cahill from the Center for Global Leadership. Dr. Jim Klingler, who couldn't join us, and Tu Luskri from the Center for Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship. <clears throat> Dr. John Kozup and Katie Bechtel from the Center for Marketing and Public Policy. Dr. Chuck Zeck from the Center for the Study of Church Management. Is Chuck here? And Dr. Sean Houghton and Jessica Taylor from the Daniel M. DeLella Center for Real Estate. I'm going to talk a little bit about the centers tomorrow, but uh, please know that these centers provide us with some terrific opportunities to remain competitive in the marketplace and to stay very innovative at VSB and really at Villanova. And so I thank all of the leadership of the centers, but also uh, all of you who, who serve in the capacity of, uh, of our advisory councils for them. Uh, it's been an exciting few months, to say the least. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a terrific honor to be the Helen and William O'Toole Dean at Villanova School of Business. And um, in my first hundred days, even though I'd been here for four years, I've learned quite a lot. Um, I, I knew and I loved the place, but I just didn't know uh, to the extent that I do now how deeply committed so many of our staff and faculty and alumni and others are. And, and so I'm just so grateful. Our, our Augustinian traditions and philosophy, uh, philosophy make us very special and set us apart. Uh, I, I directly have experienced this compared to other universities where I've uh, had the pleasure of serving on the faculty. I would say Villanova is quite unique. Uh, it's no secret that Villanova University and its business school and all of its colleges are on the rise and I'm pleased to be working with Father Peter and the other deans as we work towards reaching our fullest potential. Uh, at that time, I, at this time, I'd also like to recognize two other deans, uh, Jean Ann Linney who's the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, was, was here earlier. I think she had to go to a, an event for her college. But also, Dr. Louise Fitzpatrick is also joining us from the College of Nursing. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Reverend William Byron of the Society of Jesus, who will provide the invocation. But before I do so, um, I know that many of you learned did I fake you out, Father? I apologize. Uh, I just started, started, thought I was going to introduce you. Um, many of you have shared with me and, and, and know that this past uh, few months we lost a, a dear friend in Al Clay, the former faculty member and dean of the Villanova School of Business. And I've been touched by the many stories I've heard about Al Clay and the many of you that have expressed the impact he had in your lives. Um, and it's, I, I would say that as a new dean, it was particularly overwhelming to hear so many positive stories and to think about what a, what a direct impact a dean could have on so many people. It was, it was awe-inspiring and humbling all at the same time. So I thought uh, it would be appropriate to, uh, to offer a moment of silence in memory of uh, Dean Alclay. Thank you. 
Uh, Father Byron has had a long and successful career in higher education. He has served as president of the University of Scranton and president of Catholic University. In addition, he was dean of arts and sciences at Loyola University of New Orleans, a distinguished professor of practice of ethics at Georgetown University, and a research professor at the Selinger School of Business at Loyola College in Maryland. He currently serves as university professor of business and society at St. Joseph's University which I wasn't gonna point out as my alma mater, but Nirav took care of that. He also serves as a member of one of our advisory boards, the Center for Ch the Study of Church Management. It's a great pleasure that I introduce Father Byron. I was a good friend of Al Clay and I'm Happy to have been able to join with you in that moment of remembrance. Uh, we're going to break bread together. And when you look at it etymologically, cum pane, with bread, that's the basis for the word company. And we send young men and women from this business school out into a variety of companies all over the world, and we hope that they can bring with them the companionship that was part of their life here at Villanova and bring with them that sense of breaking themselves open in service to one another that is our basic Eucharistic theology because we are a bread-breaking people. We, like Christ, are bread-broken and passed around. So. For this invocation, I want to use an anonymous Scottish verse that I found in the Christian Science Monitor some years ago under the simple title of bread. Be gentle when you touch bread. Let it not lie uncared for, unwanted. Bread is so often taken for granted, yet there is so much beauty in bread, beauty of sun and soil, beauty of patient toil. Winds and rain have caressed it, Christ so often blessed it. Be gentle when you touch bread. Lord God, we ask that we may be gentle when we touch any part of your creation but strong and purposeful in developing your creation for the service of our brothers and sisters in the human community and for your honor and glory. So we ask that you bless us gathered here tonight as we break bread and may we receive this wonderful meal as a sign of your continuing love for us. And we ask this blessing through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Lee. Well, thank you, Patrick, and for that very kind introduction. And I want to thank Father Peter for the invitation to, to join you here today and to uh, to welcome you, those of you who are returning back to the campus to participate in this evening's uh, activities, uh, to welcome you back to uh, the seventh uh, congressional district, which as was identified, uh, includes uh, Villanova University, which I am very, very proud of. And I'm so appreciative too of the role Villanova plays, uh, not just in our community here, but the leadership role it takes in, uh, in so many different places. So I'm pleased to be back here right now and uh, as we often say, the, the nation is much safer because uh, Congress is out of session. <laughs> and that would, that would normally be the case if Congress was actually getting anything done. But these are, these are certainly remarkable times. And I come to it from an experience which is somewhat new. I am by, by trade and by profession a prosecutor. I served as seven years as the United States Attorney here prior to uh, my traveling down to my first term in Congress. Obviously, I'm in the midst of seeking a, a second term right now. So uh, it, is, uh, it is a remarkable time to be there. I'll be very, very brief in my, 
in my, uh, in, in my comments, but if I were to touch on just three things very, very quickly. One, of course, is that, that I see, having had an appreciation for the, uh, the reality of, 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 the, of, of government and its roles and business and its roles, the, the, the clash uh, that is taking place where we try to find the right and correct balance for responsible regulation that appreciates that there is a check and balance associated with government and how and where it should interact with business. But what we are doing in so many ways right now, I think, to over-regulate and, and hamper the ability for business to do what it does, which just gets to the heart of what is the top issue they're going to be talking about tonight in this debate, our economy, our jobs, and our capacity to continue to keep the United States as, uh, as, as a world leader with business. And so I, I am very appreciative of, of, of John Kozup, who invited me to join as an advisory member uh, for the business school. And I'm appreciative of the great work that is done uh, here looking at uh, issues like that. Sort of a second comment that I'll make is, you know, sort of relates to the relationship when, when you come back to Villanova so many have gone on to do great things uh, in your own careers, which many of you uh, draw back on what you learned here as being formative in helping you to get to these next, you know, to, to do the great things you've done in your lives. And so you return here with a sense of appreciation for that. One of the things about being involved and in being out there in political office, I assure you, not all of the groups are as kind and as uh, genteel as this evening is. All you have to do is go to a few town hall meetings and you see the, you know, the anxiety and, and in this gotcha mentality of politics today, it can be very, very aggressive. Uh, but one of the things you do is you really sort of get in touch with what's happening out there. You can't avoid but see how people are really seeing this world today. And obviously there's a great deal of anxiety out there. There's a great deal of uncertainty. You know that as business leaders, but there's a great deal of uncertainty in people's lives. And they're losing a sense of confidence in the very institutions that we have had, that we've relied on. And I think the one place that, it, 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 if there's a connection where I think it's sort of important, where I see it right now remarkably, and it's really been in the last four or five years, is in places like right here, where we have these remarkable young men and women who are graduating, and they bring with them a skill set that is just ready, and, and years before, you would have been stealing them by their sophomore and junior year to make sure they came to your company. And now they're coming out of college, they've made the commitment, they've taken the loans, and they're beginning the process of saying, what's next? And there's this tremendous sense of, you know, what's the bargain all about, and what do I do next? And, and to me, that's one of the real troubling things that we see right now is how do we maintain that sense of connection and purpose with some of these young men? I, I will tell you that I had a, a young man uh, uh, from Villanova uh, who Father Stack is a, is a wonderful friend and he called me up and, and, and he directed a, a young man to me last year and he got a chance and I, I got the ability to work with him and, and He's done marvelously, moving on to law school right now, uh, but he represented a, a, a kid who was stupendous, but was looking for, where do I start, where's my first start? And so I think if I was to leave with that second observation, it is that as you come back to institutions like this, it's great to come back and support the institution, but I would leave you with, it, with, with the challenge to find a way to engage and to meaningfully come back and look for ways in which you can draw those students from here in Villanova that are looking for that next opportunity into your world to at least give them the advice and the contacts and the connection to make that important next step. I have confidence we are gonna get our economy back and begin the process of giving them a sense of opportunity. But it, 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 somebody talked about the potential for this lost generation of kids who, who, who you know, don't know how to make that contact. And they're gonna be 24, 25, and 26 years old before they've had their first meaningful job. 
let alone having the kind of money after the student loans to make a down payment on a house to do all the things that we used to take for granted. So we're in a precarious time. I think as business leaders, that's one of the little things you can do, especially if you love this institution the way you do, connect back with it and find a way to give those students looking for guidance a chance to make that connection. And then I guess just the third very, very quick observation is obviously these are remarkable times. It's kind of incredible to think about that tonight in some way could be a very dispositive, important event in the, the nation's history by virtue of the nation has finally gone to see the two men who are going to sit across from each other and hash out these great challenges that we face as a nation and allow people to then make the decisions about where we go in these next four years. I will say to you, being down there, what we do in these next four years is going to have remarkable implications for the next 40 to 50. And there's no doubt that what we do in the next three months is going to set the tone for that. I think that an awful lot of what has been uh, the, the influence of this coming election has had something to do with the inability to get to yes. Your business leaders, you know what it means to, to, to get to yes, to find a way to resolve things, to work through the adhesions and get to a solution. And that's the frustration for me and the frustration for so many down in Congress is the inability for some particular reason to get to a solution. But we know that we can't afford to continue not to do so. Because if we fail to do so, the markets themselves are going to put the discipline on it in any event. And so there are going to have to be tough, tough decisions that are made. And they aren't easy. Many of you have run successful businesses, but I suspect that not many of you haven't gone through a period of time where in order to get to that success, you've had to make very, very tough decisions, tough choices, and frankly, choices that have been hard on people that you know and care about. That's what Congress needs to do in working with the President. We have great long-term challenges with the debt. We have great short-term challenges in creating the kind of environment that will once again create a sense of confidence, remove the uncertainty, and allow, if we get the bureaucracy and the government out of the way, to allow the, the, the inherent strength that is America and American ingenuity and American competitiveness to get the kind of circumstances that allow them to once again grow an economy that can support the needs and challenges of our nation. Uh, I, I do believe that it can be done, but I don't, I obviously have a prejudice about who I hope wins tonight. But it's immaterial to our nation in some sense as to who it is, what needs to be is we have to have real leadership from the top once this election is over. The President of the United States cannot allow it to be passed on to one House of Congress or whether there's an ability to get the Senate to agree on bills that we send over. There has to be a readiness for the President to roll up his sleeves to get the leadership in the room and to not leave until he has influenced and worked together the ability for the leaders to come to conclusions that will allow us to give predictable and specific direction to where we're going as a nation, as an economy, to begin to build our way out of it. Leadership is going to be essential. And that's what's being taught right here in the business school. So oftentimes, what do they say? You learn it in the school you are, or you learn it in school. The reality is it's not just the learning, it's the application that is necessary as well. I am so grateful for the opportunity to be with you here today, and I look forward for the continuing collaboration, not only with the business school, but the great University of Villanova uh, as we continue to meet the challenges uh, in the days ahead. Thank you for having me. It's now my pleasure to uh, introduce Catherine Keating, who's the head of in Investment Management Americas with J.P. Morgan. 
uh, class of 1984 ANS. Uh, uh, she is also the vice chair of the Villanova Board of Trustees. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you everybody for being here tonight to celebrate the Villanova School of Business. Thank you for inviting me as a non-graduate of the business school uh, to be here and also uh, to, to celebrate Sheila Clem. As I was uh, telling her folks tonight, Sheila and I were here on campus together. She was one year ahead of me, uh, and I followed her on campus from dorm to dorm. I followed her into the Blue Key Society. After we graduated, I followed her to our first apartment building. I even followed her to our, to our first company. And it is such a pleasure to be here just one moment before she is. So thank you, uh, everybody, for that. My job, actually, is to uh, introduce Father Peter tonight, who, of course, needs no introduction. So this uh, will, be, will be simple. You know that he is the 32nd president of this great university. You know uh, that he's in his sixth year already, which is kind of hard to believe um, as our leader. But what you might not know uh, is why the Board of Trustees thinks that P Father Peter is so uniquely suited to lead our university and to lead it uh, at this time. So I thought maybe I would tell you that. And that is that when we think of the qualities that define Villanova, they're actually the qualities that define Father Peter. When you think of Villanova, you think of scholarship. All of our faculty, of course, great scholars, Father Peter, uh, no exception. His field, as you know, is theater arts. I hear he's actually um, exercising that and, and directing a play on campus uh, this semester. Uh, but we need that kind of leadership and scholarship here as the number one regional university in US News and World Report for 20 years, uh, which is just terrific. When you think of Villanova, you think of service. Over 5,000 of our students, alumni, faculty, every year getting together and serving the larger Philadelphia community, hundreds of thousands of hours. Uh, we need a great service leader here at Villanova, and that's Father Peter. When you think of Villanova, you think of stewardship, both the amazing legacy of Veritas, Unitas, Caritas. I think we all agree that the world needs more truth, more unity, more community. Um, we need more, pe more people like Father Peter, frankly. Uh, and when you think of Villanova, you think of sustainability. The campus itself, you may or may not know that we are now recognized as one of the most environmentally responsible campuses in the country. But also the master plan, the sustainability of this whole enterprise uh, that Father Peter is leading. And you see it on your table, Ignite Change, uh, Go Nova. So I am pleased to introduce to you a scholar, a servant, a steward, and somebody who sustains us all, and also a very dear friend, Father Peter Donahue. My notes say thank you, Dean Majidi. So um, <laughs> and thank you, <laughs> thank you, Catherine. Good evening, and it's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. You'll be hearing from me a little later on this evening. But at this time, I would like to proceed with the Bartley Alumni Medallion presentation. I am honored to recognize this year's recipient of the Reverend Joseph C. Bartley OSA Alumni Medallion. This alum annual award recognizes alumni who have distinguished themselves in their careers, demonstrated service to their communities, and extraordinary service to the Villanova School of Business. It is the highest distinction bestowed to VSV alumni. Named after Reverend Joseph Bartley, OSA, the award recipient embodies the Augustinian ideals of veritas, unitas, and caritas, truth, unity, and love. Father Bartley's life and ministry are remembered as more than just the name of a building here on campus. Father Bartley was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1893. He entered St. Rita's Hall, the House of Postulants, in 1909, and was received into the, the Augustinian novitiate in 1912. After completing his collegiate and the theological studies at Villanova, he was ordained to the priesthood 
in, at, in St. Charles Seminary in 1919. He received his PhD in economics in 1922 and for the next 40 years was, was associated with the Villanova College. In 1928, when the School of Commerce and Finance was established, he became its first dean. He held this position until his death at the age of 69 in 1962. He is buried on campus near the St. Thomas of Villanova Church and Bartley Hall, now the Villanova School of Business Building, as many of you know, is named in his honor. At this time, I would like to invite Tracy Brawla, 19, class of 1990 and a VSB graduate, and the president-elect of the Villanova University Alumni Association to join me on the stage to assist with the presentation of the Bartley Alumni Medallion. And I think Dean Majidi is coming with her. <laughs> Although it doesn't say that. But I saw him sneaking up here. The award selection committee, comprised of VSB staff, faculty from each of the academic areas, met to review the nominations and has chosen, with my strong endorsement, Sheila Clem, a 1983 graduate of Villanova School of Business and a member of Villanova University's Board of Trustees. Sheila, would you please come forward? Sheila is a leader in the field of wealth management and currently serves as the executive director in Morgan Stanley's private wealth management division. She has pre previously been named to Barron's list of top 100 women financial advisors and was selected as one of the top 50 women in business in 2011 by New Jersey Biz. Prior to joining Morgan Stanley, Sheila worked at J.P. Morgan for 22 years focusing almost exclusively on private wealth management. In the spirit of a true Villanovan, Sheila is an extremely enthusiastic alumni and a philanthropist. She is a member of the Villanova University Board of Trustees, where she serves on the Investment Committee and the Student Life Committee. Prior to becoming a trustee, Sheila served as VSB's Dean's Advisory Council for six years and as the chair of the council for the last two years. In 2011, Sheila was appointed to the Women's Leadership Board of Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. She has also served on the Board of Trustees at the Morristown Bead School and as the Endowment Committee member at the Peck School. And in 1993, she's co-founded the Student Partner Alliance, a Newark-based nonprofit providing financial assistance and mentoring to economically disadvantaged high school students. She also serves as Director Emeritus for her foundation. Sheila is also quite active within the Women's Association of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. <laughs> we'll talk later. Where she has served as President and ex officio member of the Board of Trustees and ex in the executive committee and a member of the nominating and governance committee. As trustee of the Hank Clem Foundation, Sheila also, along with her son Hank, who is a student here at Villanova, uh, provides financial support to improve the lives of teens undergoing cancer treatment. Sheila and her son also speak on behalf of the New York Blood Center and other healthcare organizations to raise awareness regarding the importance of donating blood. Sheila is co-founder and board member of giftsthatgive.com, an online retailer that supports charitable contributions by giving 20% of the value of purchases to the charity of the customer's choice. She is the proud mother of two sons, Hank, who's with us tonight, a VSB student, and Bryce. She is married to Henry, a 1980 graduate of Villanova School of Business. Sheila truly embodies the spirit of veritas, caritas, and unitas in everything she touches. She has demonstrated outstanding success in her professional life, remarkable service to her community, and a strong commitment to VSB and Villanova University. 
It is with distinct pleasure and pride that I present the 2012 Reverend Joseph C. Bartley OSA Alumni Medallion to Sheila Clinton. Well, it's such an honor to be here, and I want to let you know that I'm a woman of few words. One of my great mistakes at Villanova is that I never stepped foot into Father Peter's theater class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm really humbled and honored to receive this war award, and I want to let you know that Villanova has given me much more uh, than I can possibly give back to Villanova. So I want to thank everyone and enjoy the conference. It's just an incredible privilege to be here with all of you. Thank you. There's been a change in the program. And uh, that change is that uh, I cannot be here all day tomorrow. And uh, I was supposed to speak with, to you at lunchtime. And I knew that once all of you saw that on the schedule, you would all decide to leave before lunch. <laughs> so um, they changed it around in order to accommodate my schedule because I have to leave early in the morning for something else, um, that I would speak to you tonight. And uh, Pat said, it's now your turn to get up there and speak. Would you like to be introduced again? And I said, no, that's OK. I think they all know who I am. So I'm going to share with you some thoughts that I shared with the university uh, at the beginning of this academic year. Uh, this is a kind of an abbreviated version of my kind of state of the university or my message to the university. Uh, that I deliver annually as the academic year starts. And um, after it's over, I will, um, if you would like to ask me any questions about what I said or anything that's going on at the university, um, I will entertain questions for a little while. But uh, the schedule reads that uh, you're going to all go off and watch the debate if you want to. And uh, so I have to watch my time here. So here we go. Higher education is facing some significant challenges, and this summer revealed several dramatic examples. More than 10 colleges across the country announced that they will be closing or on the brink of financial disaster, a sign that there is still a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the economy. The University of Virginia's president, Teresa Sullivan, heralded two years ago as one of the leading voices in academia was forced to resign, only to be reinstated 16 days later in a stunning turnaround by her board. Penn State was hit with several sanctions for failing to report known child abuse. This certainly is not the only institution that has placed reputation over integrity, but it has ignited a national debate in higher education about the overemphasis of athletics and institutional greed and a lost focus on academic mission. Beyond these headlines, higher education faces challenges and pressures that may not capture as much attention, but are no less important. Growing competition among colleges for both national and international students. The cost and uncertainties of technology continue to change day by day. Shrinking state and federal funding, rising tuition costs, mounting student debt, the growth of online classes, pressures to shift away from a traditional liberal arts education in favor of more professional training, and the deteriorating incomes and uncertain employment opportunities are leading many to question whether college is worth the cost. Faculty tenure is being questioned as a poor business model, and there is a cry to reform traditional 
teaching pedagogy in favor of what is called flipped classrooms, where the student's homework is watching lectures online by superstar professors and class time is devoted to interactive activities. These challenges contribute to an increasing calls for transformation through higher education, with critics quick to suggest that the sector is better at resisting change than embracing it. They preach that universities need to adopt stronger business model, and they fault us for not taking measures that could cut cost and strengthen profit margins. However, education is not and should not be a business. It is a collaboration between faculty, staff, and students. It is layers of governance working together to set guidelines and designs curriculum. It is a focus on creating educational models that will stimulate critical thinking. It is scholarship and research that will contribute new knowledge to academic disciplines. It is serving the mission of the institution so that it can serve others. It is not making profits, but, prof but profiting the larger community. It is not about the quality or the quantity of graduates, but the quality of the education and the preparation they receive. True, colleges and universities can learn from business practices, but operating a college as a business, I believe, is a mistake. Considering the audience tonight, that statement may not be very well received, but allow me to clarify. I do not mean that institutions should refrain from modeling good business practices in their operations. The bottom line is important, and we must be efficient in the ways we manage operating aspects of the institution. However, our output, the product of the educational process, does not conform to business principles. The pursuit of knowledge and the personal growth and development of students, especially in the context of our Augustinian ideals, is not black and white. It is very gray and must adapt to the needs and the abilities of each individual student. Education must reflect the institution, and it is delivered through a diverse faculty and set of individual ex experiences. It would be a mistake to operate or assess this very personal process in the same way as a corporation, manufacturer, or some other profit-making enterprise would do. This distinction aside, the challenges, pressures, and criticisms that the education sector faces are real. We must acknowledge them and work to address them. Part of this is being brutally honest with ourselves so that we can get to the root of the issues and identify solutions that will work. The right decision will not always be the easy one, but the fear of change cannot hold us back from transforming the way we think or the way we operate moving forward. First and foremost, on everybody's minds is the high cost of tuition. Unless we address how students will pay for the Villanova education we value so much, we will find ourselves maintaining and entertaining a campus of elite and entitled students. A student body devoid of economic diversity would chip away at our Augustinian identity and change who we are. This is not and cannot be Villanova University. Therefore, we have to find ways to ignite change. We need to wake up the culture of giving at Villanova. This means finding new sources of revenues, stimulating corporate and foundation giving, and appealing to our alumni, parents, and friends. While many strides have occurred in all of these areas, we need to do more. On the other side of that equation is the issue of our expenses, the resources it takes to operate this institution and support its mission. We have taken great pains over the past several years to reduce waste and maximize efficiencies in our operation. We must continue these efforts to ensure that we are careful stewards of the university's resources and are doing what we can do to minimize the cost we pass on to students and to their families. Part of this self-examination is a thorough look at the programs and services we support throughout campus we need to ask ourselves a series of questions. Are we spreading our resources too thin? Are we doing too much? 
Why are we so eager to add, but so reluctant to subtract? Are there programs, either academic or otherwise, that have served their purpose, but have lost their luster? Do we have the necessary resources to elevate some areas in the future? And if not, then maybe we should be, they should be eliminated. Are there too many athletic programs and too little money to support them? Where will the cuts or the reshaping have the greatest impact? To get to the answers to these kinds of questions, we need to embark upon a thorough study. Such a study will take time, but we need to begin the analysis. And when we have the information, we need to be bold enough to act upon it. The challenges related to tuition and costs are laid out right in front of us, but some of them are not so tangible. Do we have an active imagination? That, that is the necessary tool as we consider the future of our learning. Online learning is a market we cannot ignore or dismiss. Rather, it is one that we need to embrace. There are risks and there are advantages. There are imperfections and possibilities. Technology changes daily and our students know it and adopt it. We cannot be afraid of it or over-examine its capabilities. We are well-educated people, but many times we wait for someone else or some other institution to make the move. We need to invent new ways to blast today's classroom into places where our students want to learn. We need more creative thinking. We need to use our imagination. The chair of the board, Terry O'Toole, has an example of the Harvard Business School that he loves to share with everybody. Harvard does not teach basic accounting, but instead requires students to take an online course that is offered by a professor at another institution. They believe he is the best person to teach Harvard students the principles of basic accounting. Harvard is then able to focus its resources on areas where it excels. Do we have the imagination here to tackle problems in a similar way? MOOC, short for Massive Open Online Course, is the latest acronym and the big buzzword in higher education. Free online courses have become a public relations bonanza for schools that participate in them and which include big names such as MIT and Stanford. But think about it. These prestigious universities are highly, highly selective when admitting students and I doubt they will ever offer their diploma for free. Offering a free online course to thousands of people is one thing when only about 10% of them actually finish it. Offering them an elite degree is quite another. However, MOC have provided a flock of sheep. And before joining the flock, we need to think of ways we can use technology to carve out a different path. For instance, while the appeal of free online courses builds, does the desire among participants to interact, so does the desire among participants to interact. According to a recent article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, students in these courses are increasingly forming groups, both online and in the real world, to study and socialize. It is early in the process, but it seems that community whether in person or online, is still something that students want as part of their education. Community is the one aspect that distinguishes a Villanova education. We need creative thinking to imagine new ways of doing what we already do so well. How can we do it? How can we be leaders in emerging trends while also remaining true to who we are? The emergence of online learning is but one indi indication that in many ways, the motivation for attending college has changed. For previous generations, college was for a selective few seeking few further to further their education. In 1970, I graduated from a very small high school in a middle class suburb of Detroit. The senior class numbered 87, and less than half of us applied to college. Of those 32 people, only two left the state. I'm sure that my experience is not unique, but the overwhelming majority of people today do not enroll in college to get an education. 
They are seeking the credentials to gain a successful job. Recently, I was sent an essay written by Carlo Salino from the Education Service Group at Xerox. He was reflecting on the economics of massive open online courses and their sudden surge in popularity. He believes that knowledge learned is easily forgotten. That is not a new concept. Just ask any recent college graduate to retake an exam they took just five years ago. I don't think you'd like the outcome. The current structure for evaluating knowledge is built around point-in-time assessment like exams. But repeated evaluation over time of a person's comprehension and understanding. How many times have you heard a college student boast about never opening a book, skipping classes, or pulling an all-nighter to study for an exam? Yet, they passed the class. According to Salino, it is the credential that people value and carry with them years later, not necessarily the education. Learning no longer takes place only in classrooms or on campuses. There are plenty of low-cost free alternatives, books on every topic, free online courses, internships, TED lectures on YouTube, and even cable television. If learning can take place everywhere, there has to be a reason then for pe that people would be willing to spend thousands and of th thousands and thousands of dollars several years of their life to get a college education. As Salino points out, it's not for the education. No one is going to land a job at Air Products, the State Department, Goldman Sachs, or Children's Hospital of Philadelphia by watching a YouTube presentation or the Discovery Channel. While they are informative and entertaining and may provide some conversation starters at parties, it is the GPA and the college trans transcript that will get you the job. That is why students will continue to seek an institution, and while Villanova must continue to position itself as a place that can both educate and provide the credential. But we cannot rely on our reputation or any measures of past success. It is no, long, it is no longer enough to have a rich history, successful alumni, competitive admissions. College and universities must be self-critical. Board of Trustees from coast to coast including our own, are raising concerns about costs and how we deliver education. Where are we headed academically, residentially, and technolo technologically? We have some ambitious plans for the future. It is, and is this the right time to pursue them? There have been questions posed as to whether our proposed Lancaster Avenue development, featuring residence halls, limited retail, and the Sheila Clem Performing Center for Arts <laughs> is the direction we should be taking. If online education is the wave of the future, should we be investing in more residence halls? It's a, it's a legitimate question, but its answer depends on how you view the purpose of college and universities. Education online is intended to transmit knowledge. Campuses do far more. They transform people, and I believe this project will transform the university. The transformation of the main parking lots will mean that people will no longer drive past Villanova. They will drive through Villanova. Initially, I referred to this project as the hamlet. Technically, it was the wrong term. It sounded too small. I intended to embrace the old and the new and harken back to the time when Villanova College and the monastery were a small settlement in a rural area. I saw the idea of the hamlet as a way to recapture a vision for Villanova, but instead the project offers a bold new vision. Look carefully at the model or the architectural renderings. It is the visualization of a community, living, learning, faith and spiritual development, art and entertainment. It is the embodiment of that small settlement that shapes the Renaissance thinker blending everything into one commons. Through a series of buildings that will rise from a drab parking lot, we will be expanding the transformative power of Villanova University. And so we will move forward with this project, with facing the challenges that lie ahead, with working together to position Villanova to thrive for generations to come. We must move forward. We must act boldly today so that the future generations of Villanovans can benefit. There is uncertainty in both the changes we will make 
and the path we will take to get there, but we cannot, we must not, let that stop us from thinking and acting boldly. We need to do more as individuals and as a community to ignite change. Last year, the university launched the Ignite Change Go Nova as a way to better tell the Villanova story. The idea was that we know the story, but we needed a clear and concise way to share, concise, concise way to share that story with others. The examples of Villanova's igniting change that we have collected since then have been amazing. It is clear that long after their graduation, our alumni use their learning, use what they learned here to ignite positive change. It is very powerful to see how the Augustinian ideals are put into action in so many ways. If you have not visited IgniteChangeGoNova.com to see these stories, I would encourage you to do so. There are some amazing stories there. People have connected with the initiative. Often, they find themselves, often when I find myself in conversations with alumni, they will tell me how this one phrase captures what Villanova education has meant to them. It provides a connection from who they were to who they have become. They get it and are eager to spread the word. Our students get it too. It took them a little longer, but they get it. They are young and idealistic. And their notion of being able to ignite change in ways large and small is what drives them confidently into the future. This is a viewpoint we should all embrace. We should be identifying the spark within them, feeding it, and pushing it forward. No student should ever say they did not feel challenged at Villanova or by Villanova. We need to get them to understand that change isn't about success every time. Change comes from a combination of knowledge, determination, idealism, and hope. These are characteristics we should be fostering in each of our students. They also should be characteristics that we foster within ourselves as members of the greater Villanova community, alumni, parents, and friends. We need to embrace change. It is not something that we should be afraid of, but instead something we should look forward to. The last 20 years have been significant transformation around this campus. Buildings have been constructed or renovated. The core curriculum has been refined. Programs have been added or eliminated. Many faculty and staff and administrators, deans, and even presidents have come and gone. And the type of students we seek to enroll have become more talented. It's important to remember that no matter what change occurs, either above or beneath the surface, our institutional ident identity remains the same. Yet, I continually hear about the way things used to be. There is a longing for the past when things were more simple, when it may have been easy to get things done, when everybody's plate wasn't so full. I hear from some on campus that too much has changed. That is not the way we used to be. This is not the way that Villanova has done it. From others, not enough has changed. We lag behind our competitors. We need more. I'm not getting enough. From alumni, I hear that Villanova has become too hard to get into that it has forgotten the type of student that it used to enroll. Is this really that, is the issue really that Villanova is not what it used to be? Or is it that Villanova is not what some of us want it to be? The history of the institution can serve to guide us as we move forward, but we cannot let it restrict us. Our focus should never again be on what Villanova used to be, but instead on what Villanova can be, what it should be, and what it will be. We speak often of community, and rightly so. Students, alumni, parents, friends, faculty, staff, all share a blue and white passion. But in order for our community to thrive, it must receive the best of you. Do not take from it, but find ways to give to it. The opportunities to be involved with Villanova are virtually limitless find a way to connect. Whether it's massive open online courses or whatever comes next, higher education continues to evolve and we must evolve with it. It is not about chasing fads or embracing gimmicks to draw attention. It is about positioning the university for long-term success and viability. <coughs> Challenges and pressures are coming from every direction. We must be agile, thorough, and strategic as we face them. 
We must be ready to make some hard decisions, and we must be ready to think differently. We must be ready to change. Our community is evolving. It must. It must be dynamic to serve the changing needs of the students who come to us for a distinctive education that we offer. We cannot sit still. We cannot wish for the way things used to be. We must look forward. Today, I am appealing to everyone to seize the opportunity to be change agents at Villanova <coughs> University. It's not my responsibility. It's all of our responsibility. We are being challenged so that what we do as members of the Villanova community to meet the challenge. What will we do to, to demonstrate that Villanova is a value, that we educate on multiple levels, and that our students receive the credentials they seek? Villanova invites our students into a process of living and learning of faith and reason. What will we do to help them discover that they have the power to ignite change? Thank you. And I strategically gave you eight minutes to answer questions. So. Any questions? Yes, Kevin. What is the groundbreaking on the Hamlet? Well, it's, um, it's been a process. Um, we have taken it several times to Radnor Township um, and have made tweaks in it. Um, they, you know, that it is a back and forth and um, this is nice, that isn't, this is too big, that's not big enough, this is, well, they never say that's not big enough, but um, it's, um, so we're going through the process. So we've taken it to the commissioners, the commissioners asked us to work with the uh, township staff, that's what we're presently doing. I think in a couple of weeks they are, they're taking the revisions of the model back to them again. And they've asked for some um, simplifying of things. So the parking structure was too big for one thing. and So they've asked for more surface parking. So we've done some of those things and now it's back and forth, back and forth. So If all goes well, this is fiberglass, but there must be wood somewhere. Um, uh, we hope that maybe by next spring we could be breaking ground. Hope. Spring is eternal. That's where it is right now. Wow. This is the quietest alumni group I've ever had. Well, thank you for being here. Enjoy the evening, uh, enjoy the debate. Uh, I will see you in the morning, early in the morning, I think. Um, and I have to run off to something else right now, but uh, I hope I thank all of you to enjoy the evening and thank you especially for being here and supporting Villanova and the Villanova School of Business.